Oh, hello, everybody. Welcome to Ms. McGuire online video lectures. And today we are covering the lymphatic system. And um, so lymphatic system, um, let me skip over here first. Um, so I want to tell you about a function of lymphatic system before we um, talk about uh, organization, anatomy, and physiology of it. So the function include the... Uh, transport of excess fluid from tissues back to the bloodstream and immune response. So lymphatic system um, is made of um, organs and uh, vessels, right? So this network of vessels, um, they carry uh, fluids from your tissue and from your organs back to your blood. Um, and lymphatic system, the second function is your immune response. So when you study anatomy, you will hear um, the name of the system as lymphatic. If you study physiology, uh, instead of lymphatic system, you will hear immune system. Um, so immune system actually um, is based on a lymphatic, right? So now, uh, because one of the functions of your lymphatic system is your immunity, let's talk about pathogens that um, cause uh, diseases. So this is uh, foreign agents or pathogens that can cause a disease. And uh, one of them is bacteria. Okay. Um, so I want to, excuse me, just a second. I want to remove this because I want va vanishing pen instead of regular one. Okay, so the first is bacteria. So what is bacteria? Bacteria is a living organism. It's a single cell organism. So you can see here electron, a picture uh, of the bacteria. They can have a different shape. Uh, they can be like uh, circular, we call them cocci, or they can be uh, uh, short rods, we call them bacilli. Uh, but anyway, this, those are living organisms, unicellular organisms um, that can um, infect your tissue, your organ, your cells. Some bacteria contains capsule that allow them to stick to surfaces, for example, your teeth. And it's also make it harder for your white blood cells or your phagocytic cells. Phagocytic cells are your white blood cells to destroy them or eat them. Uh, another pathogen um, is a virus. Virus is not a living organism. It's not made of cells. A virus is a bridge between living and non-living. It's smaller than bacteria. And a virus is replicate by taking over the machinery inside the cell. So for virus to replicate, virus need to enter the cell. So uh, on this um, uh diagram, or oh, I'm sorry, this is uh, electron mass microscope slide. Um, so you see viruses. Um, those are uh, viruses that infect bacteria, but the same principle works for uh, viruses infecting human cells. And you can see how they inject the genetic material inside the host cell. And then this host cell or your own cells will make more viruses. Right, so bacteria and viruses are not the only pathogens. Uh, they can cause diseases, but they are probably most common. We have also um, the other um, uh, living organism like uh, proteins that can cause disease and even microscopic worms. But bacteria and viruses are the most common um, pathogens that um, cause many uh, infective diseases. Okay, so uh, where all these bacteria and viruses, um, well, I mean, how you can, um, how you can um, get the infection, right? So how this virus and bacteria can enter your body. So every time you have opening in your body, uh, like your nasal cavity, your oral cavity, or you have a wound, you cut yourself, you cut your skin, this create, uh, entering points for bacteria and viruses. And of course, your mouth and your nose are always open um, an entry point. Um, uh, so some uh, viruses and bacteria can um, enter our body uh, because um, 
you know, they, they already present in our food. Um, so when you refrigerate your food, does it kill bacteria? And the answer is no. Um, this temperature that you have in your refrigerator, even in your freezer, is not uh, cold enough um, for bacteria to die. Um, it does slow down growth of the bacteria, but it doesn't stop it. So not only it doesn't kill bacteria, the bacteria can still multiply inside your refrigerator, right, on the surface of your food. So best way to kill bacteria is high temperature or boiling. Another question is, are antibacterial cleaners really effective? And um, the question is really uh, no. We don't have enough data that would tell us that uh, those cleaners are more effective than uh, washing with regular soap and water. Um, so um, there, the studies suggest that the, there is no significant difference from using antibacterial cleaners and just washing your hands. Plus, and, uh, those cleaners, they have chemicals, like, for example, triglozan, that um, be we believe affect our immune system and endocrine system. Uh, so it can cause uh, possible harm to human health. In addition, using those cleaners may lead to a resistance against antibiotics. Um, so use of alcohol-based hand sanitizer um, can be effective, but it shouldn't replace normal hand washing, right? So by um, properly storing our uh, food, uh, uh, by boiling the water that we drink and washing our hands, we can, pre or using uh, alcohol sanitizer and washing our hands, we can prevent uh, bacteria well, we cannot really completely stop the bacteria from entering our body, but we can um, reduce the amount of bacteria um, that um, that does it, and this pre can prevent many uh, diseases and spread of diseases. Um, so here are our uh, functions that we um, already looked at, right? So um, lymphatic system, it's network of uh, vessels close to cardiovascular system and lymphatic organs. So it's composed of uh, lymphatic vessels and lymphatic organs. And function is, as I already mentioned before, transport excess fluid from tissue to bloodstream and immune response. Um, so we have different uh, type of lymphatic vessels and the smallest are lymphatic capillaries. They expand into tissues, form complex pathways parallel to blood capillaries. So if you look at the picture over here, um, this is your tissue. So here's your cell, right? So different cells and all of the cells require oxygen and nutrients. And oxygen and nutrients are delivered to your cells through blood vessels. Then blood vessels uh, uh, split into capillaries. So those are small blood vessels. And in these capillaries, you have exchange. So oxygen from capillaries move to your cells. Uh, food uh, from capillaries moves to your cell. And waste product and uh, carbon dioxide moves back inside the capillaries. So oh, that means that capillaries are mm, permeable, pretty permeable. They're not completely permeable. For example, like uh, blood cells uh, do not leave your capillaries, but lots of fluid leaks out of these capillaries. And then some of this fluid is actually returned back to the capillaries, but we always have excess fluid in our tissue. And this fluid is picked up by lymphatic capillaries. So this green blood vessels shown on the picture, those are lymphatic capillaries. And you can see they are, they form this complex um, structure um, with the uh, blood capillaries. Now this fluid inside lymphatic capillaries is called lymph. It's a one-way system. What does it mean, one-way system? So, for example, your blood, uh, cardiovascular system, is two-way system. That means the blood flows away from the heart and back to the heart. Now, lymphatic a lymph, a lymph flows only one way, only towards the heart. 
That's why we call it one-way system. Uh, so those lymphatic capillaries, they collect water, solutes, nutrients, electrolytes, oxygen from the tissue, and everything returns back to uh, your um, blood. So that's a one a function of the lymphatic system. And of course, we have a, a larger blood vessels. Um, so lymphatic vessels, they similar to veins that contains valves and collect fluid to return to, uh, back to your heart, right? So here's where the heart is. But it's done through the largest vessels that called ducts. So we have two major ducts that bring uh, lymph uh, to your heart. And it's uh, first is thoracic duct. Those are larger uh, vessel that collects from left arm, left side of the head and neck and area below the thorax. So if you look at this picture, you see this lighter green color that show you that all, all this area of the body um, return lymph through the thoracic duct. And this right side, smaller area, um, so fluids and lymph from right side of the body return back to the heart through a right lymphatic duct. Uh, so it's a smaller, collect from right arm, right side of head and neck. So you can see it's not... Um, uh, symmetrical, right? So it's not like you divide your body into left and right side and uh, left side is drained by one vessel and right side is drained by another vessel. No, thoracic duct pick up, picks up fluids and lymph from most of your body and a smaller part of your body is drained by right lymphatic duct. Um, but lymphatic system is not only made of vessels, right? We just cover the vessel, capillaries, vessels, duct, but we also have organs. So lymphatic organs are divided into primary lymphatic organs and secondary lymphatic organs. Primary organs responsible for production and maturation of white blood cells. Production means they are formed and maturation, that means they are grow and became um ready to function, right? Um, so they mature, they um, they change and mature. Um, so in that's happened in primary. In secondary, secondary lymphatic organs responsible for storage of these mature white blood cells until they activated by the corresponding pathogens. So white blood cells need to be formed, right? need to be, uh, need to mature. So all of this happen in primary organs. And then we need to store them and activate them. And act, uh, how how they activate it, how white blood cells are activated? Well, when they meet with the pathogens, when they recognize their first pathogens, that's uh, this pathogen will activate them. And the storage and activation happens in, uh, secondary lymphatic organs. So then what are those primary lymphatic organs? It's a red bone marrow and a thymus. Now the thymus is this gland just uh, superior to your heart, just above your heart. Red bone marrow found inside your bones, either in a cavity or um, a between trabecula of the spongy bone. So red bone marrow found inside bones and thymus is above the heart. Those are our primary organs. Secondary organs include spleen, appendix, tonsils, and lymph nodes. Now, uh, spleen, you can see it's located right here. So it's on the left side. Um, le so it's um, left to the stomach. So here's your stomach, and that's your spleen. Uh, so appendix, is this structure over here that attached at the beginning of a large intestine called cecum. So here's the beginning of large intestine, cecum, and that's appendix. Um, right, so tonsils um, are found in your uh, pharyngeal uh, re region, right? So it's uh, a pharynx is your throat. And lymph nodes um, actually uh, distributed through your entire body. And we have... Um, a large amount of lymph nodes in the axillary 
and in renal region, but lymph nodes um, pretty much found through your entire body. So that's a secondary lymphatic organs. Okay, so we're gonna discuss um, those organs a little bit more. So here's primary lymphatic organs, bone, red bone marrow. Um, so in children, uh, red bone ma marrow is uh, found in the center of all bones. Um, and that's where this bone marrow is. In adults, red bone marrow found only in sternum, ribs, pelvic girdle, um, and of humerus and femur. Um, so you can see uh, on this picture, um, so here's the sternum, right? In adults, this is where you will find red bone marrow. Here's the ribs. Um, so that's uh, pelvic girdle uh, make your pelvis, right? And uh, here is the um, end of humerus right there and end of uh, femur. Now, red bone marrow produce all five types of white blood cells, uh, red blood cells and platelets. Um, it produces lymphocytes, uh, B or T lymphocytes or what we call B or T cells. B cells then mature in the bone marrow. That's why we call them B cells. And T cells mature in thymus. So B and T cells, they produce in the bone marrow. Then B cells, remember, in the primary uh, lymphatic organs, they also need to mature. So uh, B uh, will mature in the bone marrow. And T cells, they will move to the thymus, that is gland behind, uh, above your heart, and mature in thymus. Um, so here's our thymus, um, and you can see um, that's the heart. So this is a superior to the heart. Uh, located in thoracic cavity between the trachea and sternum. So here's the trachea behind, and sternum, of course, going to be right here, right in front of the thymus. It starts to shrink during puberty and much smaller in adults. It has two main functions. Produce a thymus hormone needed for maturation of T cells and location uh, for uh, maturation of T cells. So uh, thymus, right over here, the T cells, um, they are produced in the bone marrow, then they move inside the thymus. This is where they mature. Plus thymus produce hormone that uh, needed for that maturation. Okay, so spleen. Spleen is the largest lymphatic organ. It's located in the upper left region of the abdominal cavity, posterior to the stomach. Um, um, and spleen uh, has two regions. It has white pulp and a red pulp. Um, so this is histology slide of the spleen. And you can see this uh, white area um, on a slide. And this is called white pulp. Uh, this is where we have storage of white blood cells. Uh, and this red uh, area that called red pulp, um, this destroys old uh, red blood cells. Um, and um, yeah, so this is where old uh, red blood cells are destroyed. Um, so spleen has two functions. Um, one is related to lymphatic system function, right? The storage of uh, white blood cells. And another um, help your body to get rid from the old non-functioning uh, red blood cells. Now, the question, can you live without a spleen? The answer is a yes. People can live without spleen. And then the function of spleen will be uh, taken by liver, right? Partially, like this one engulfing and destroying, oops, I'm sorry, engulfing and destroying all, all, all uh, red blood cells, um, that liver will um, uh, take uh, over this function and storage of white blood cells, we store them in uh, other lymphatic organs, like uh, lymph nodes, for example. Uh, so um, now here's our lymph nodes, uh, found along the lymphatic uh, pathway, um, so you see those lines, those represent lymphatic blood vessels and lymph flow through the lymph nodes. So here's the lymph flows inside um, lymph node and then it's exit the lymph node through the 
uh, efferent lymphatic vessels. It contains large number of lymphocytes and macrophages, and a function of lymph node is to filter lymph and monitor body fluid for pathogens. That's called immune surveillance. Uh, surveillance. All right, so that's the lymph nodes, and you can see um, you have a lot of lymph node in the inguinal, femoral region, uh, in your armpit, axillary region, in uh, along your um, vertebral column, tonsils. Tonsils are located around the pharynx, and pharynx is your throat. Um, their function is identification and destruction of pathogens entering through mouth and nose. And a tonsillectomy is a removal of tonsils because of repetitive infection of tissue swelling. Uh, so tonsils are located, um, as it says over here in your uh, pharynx, and this is the entry point for many pathogens. So they guide this enters to um, uh, to your body through nose and uh, mouth. Appendix located in the low right abdomen, uh, beginning at the large intestine cecum, right? So that's, uh, as we said, so here inside, that's a small intestine, and this is large intestine. And the first part of large intestine is called cecum. Uh, so this is where appendix is attached. Um, so it's believed to contain good bacteria that um, repopulate the large intestine bacteria after diarrhea or other conditions that damage intestinal bacteria. And appendectomy is a removal of appendix because of severe inflammation. Okay, and as the next part of this chapter is uh, our immunity and types of defense. So we have two types of defense, innate immunity that is non-specific and adaptive immunity that is specific. And we will talk about each types in more details. Um, so here's our uh, innate immunity uh, or what is called non-specific defense. Um, this one is fully functional without previous exposure of to the invaders. So your immune um, innate immunity, you pretty much you born with this immunity. So you don't need a pathogen to activate it. Um, this one triggered shortly after infection. And there is no specific recognition of pathogens. So whatever pathogen enters your body, uh, your immune system gonna uh, attack it. There is no memory about this infection. So every uh, next inf infection is like a new one. So, and any pathogen attacked by the same cells. So there is no any um, specific um, cells that would attack the pathogen. Uh, this one will not remember the pathogen if it is introduced in, in a later time. So no memory. Um, and in, innate immunity include physical barrier, chemical barrier, inflammatory response, and protective proteins that called complement. So just to sum up very quickly, innate immunity is non-specific defense. You born with innate immunity. So you born with your physical barriers at your skin, right? With the chemical barriers that the chemicals in your skin or mucous membrane. Um, uh, you have this inflammatory response and you have complement that will affect uh, the pathogen. Um, so um, this immunity, um, doesn't recognize a pathogen, it uh, triggers uh, shortly after infection, and it doesn't leave you with a memory about infection. And the second is adaptive or non-specific defense that we will talk uh, um, in the next couple slides, right? So first, let's finish with innate immunity. Uh, we just said that innate immunity include a physical barrier. What does it mean? Well, the first, it's your skin. So skin is a physical barrier that prevents a pathogen, virus, bacteria to enter your body. 
Uh, when you have cut in your skin, you break this barrier. That's possibly entry point for pathogens. Another physical barrier include mucus. Uh, mucus may incline your digestive, respiratory, reproductive, and urinary tract. Um, so uh, this mucus um, uh, has, uh, so mucus membrane has uh, special cells that produce mucus and mucus trap the bacteria. So respiratory tract collecting particles as you breathe and these particles in the mucus um, that also uh, contains uh, bacteria or some other viruses maybe. And then you swallow this mucus. Um, so that goes to your stomach. And in the stomach, you have your chemical barrier. So that acid that will destroy that bacteria, right? So physical barrier, skin and mucus and chemical barrier include oil glands that are weakening or killing bacteria, saliva and sweat containing a lysosome. Those are antimicrobial compound that also destroy bacteria, gastric juices, acidic environments that kill pathogens and normal flora. Um, that is collection of bacteria in the mouth and intestine that protects you from uh, foreign bacteria, from pathogens. So this is, again, this is our innate uh, uh, immunity, physical and chemical barrier. Uh, uh, also, inflammatory response is the immune response. Uh, so when we have high level of uh, phagocytosis, that will trigger inflammatory uh, inflammation. We have four sites of inflammation, and inflammation is caused because of the release of chemical call, uh, called histamine. And histamine causes increased heat, uh, and um, what it does when we increase heat, it increases metabolism of phagocytic cells. So it helps your uh, uh, white blood cells um, um, to fight the bacteria. It also prevent growth of some bacteria. Uh, another sign is clot uh, formation at site injury. So this will be if you have, uh, of course, bleeding. Uh, pain. Uh, collection on fluid and tissue uh, increase the pressure of a nerve endings and those nerve and nerve cells send signal of pain to your brain and increase blood flow that uh, cause uh, edema and uh, redness. Um, now, when we increase blood flow, that give us easy access uh, of uh, white blood cells to the site of damage. Right, so inflammatory response, and again, it's a part of your immune defense and inflammation because of the high level of, of phagocytosis uh, will cause uh, a, a, a heat, uh, uh, clot, pain, and redness. Those uh, we call four signs of inflammation. And uh, the last um, part of the immune innate immune response that we will discuss is called um, uh, complement proteins. Complement proteins are proteins over here, you can see them, that circulate in your blood plasma. And um, when we have a bacteria present, those proteins are activated. And when they activate it, they attach to the bacteria membrane. So you can see over here, they're attaching to the uh, membrane of the bacteria and they create holes in the membrane. So you see, that's a holes. And what happened then water, so you have, uh, you know, um, tissue fluids. So you have fluids in your tissue and it starts entering bacteria through those pores. So fluids enter the bacteria, bacteria swell up and burst. Right, so this is how complement kills uh, a bacteria. Um, so all of this is what we um, cover over here, uh, part of the innate immunity, physical barrier, chemical barrier, inflammatory response, and complement. This is our protective protein that make holes inside bacterial uh, membrane and that kills bacteria. So now we are in adaptive immunity. Um, so um, adaptive immunity is a response against uh, 
a protein of a pathogen called antigens. So every pathogen, every bacteria, every virus on the surface of their cells, they have a protein that called antigens. So your white blood cells respond to those antigens. Uh, adaptive immunity mostly associated with B and T lymphocytes. And each cell has, uh, so each B cell, each T cell uh, has the only one type of receptor that can only recognize one specific antigen. That's why this is called your adaptive or specific immunity, because you will have different types of B cells and different types of T cells. Um, so like a family of B cell. And that one group, one family of B cells will only respond to one specific antigen and other type of uh, as a family will respond to a different specific antigen. Um, so as we just mentioned that adaptive immunity is mostly associated with B cells and T cells. So now how these B cells and T cells are formed and how they activated um, all right, uh, um, and what they, uh, what happened with them. So here, um, the process that um, happens with B cells that allow them to fight infection. So first B cells are producing a bone marrow. We already talked about it. Then B cells uh, mature in the same uh, place in the bone marrow. Um, then what's gonna happen, uh, B, cell, B cells, they have receptors. Uh, and this receptor will activate and recognize, I'm sorry, will recognize particular bacterial antigen. So when B cells uh, recognize antigen, the, uh, so this recognition will cause two activation of this B cell. So let's say you have um, like a hundred different B cells, uh, but only the one that has a receptor for that particular antigen that right now enter your uh, body, only this line of B cells will be activated. And when these B cells are activated, they start dividing. This is called proliferation of B cells. Uh, B cells take copies of this, themselves to form two cell categories. They will form plasma cells and memory cells. Plasma cells produce high level of antibodies to destroy infection and uh, removed afterwards. And memory cells circulate in your blood after infection is removed and act as guard. Keep a lookout for the same infection in the future. Right, so that's a process as it happened with B cells. Now with T cells, we have T cell production in the bone marrow, but they will move to the thymus, this gland above your heart to mature. Then the processes will be similar. A uh, T cell receptor will recognize the pathogen and it will activate T cells and then T cells proliferate. And when T cells proliferate, they form three categories cytotoxic T cells that create pores in the virus infected cells. So cytotoxic T cells kills your own cells that already infected by viruses. Into helper T cells, they enhance immune response and memory cells. Memory T cells, uh, the same as memory B cells, will circulate in your blood after infection is removed and act as guard, keep a lookout for the same infection in the future. Okay, and uh, so now we will look at some um, um, diseases that affect uh, human uh, lymphatic and immune system, uh, HIV and AIDS. So HIV is human immunodeficiency virus that causes AIDS. AIDS is acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. Now HIV virus infect those helper T cells and other uh, cells of immune system, but T cells, they are primary target. So person with AIDS is susceptible to infection. So if we destroy helper T cells, that we affect the whole immune system. 
A typical treatment is antiviral medications that keep the virus level under control. Uh, so uh, pneumonia is a common reason for AIDS patients um, to die, right? So we have virus. This virus, HIV, affects uh, helper T cells and cause AIDS. And what AIDS means, it's just immunodeficiency. AIDS doesn't really kill a person. What kill uh, a person are other infections that now this person cannot fight, right? Because your immune system is not working. That's why pneumonia, this will be the disease that most uh, often um, kills the AIDS patient. Well, now uh, we have way better way of treatments. So we hope no AIDS patient dies anymore because we can have this um, virus level under control. But it used to be like pneumonia uh, really was very dangerous disease that killed AIDS patients because their immune system was not able to protect them, right? So that's our HIV and AIDS. Um, immune responses. So we have a primary immune response and secondary immune response. Primary immune response created after the first time exposure to a pathogen. Um, and it includes production and release of antibodies, removal of the infective agent, so removal of the um, so this production and release of after, uh, antibodies will cause uh, removal of bacteria and viruses. Creation of memory cells and detectable level of antibodies reach um, five, 10 days after exposure. And secondary immune response, uh, exposure to previously encountered pathogens. So when you have the same um, pathogen, the same bacteria, the same viruses, entering your body second time or third time. Uh, and it caused proliferation of memory cells, detectable level of uh, uh, antibody reach one, two days after exposure. So you can see in the primary immune response, you need five, 10 days before you have enough antibodies to fight this infection. With the secondary immune response, you need only one or two days to have detectable uh, or enough antibodies to fight the in infection. Uh, and this tells us about importance of vaccination in creating secondary response. So when we, uh, when we have a vaccine, so vaccine kind of mimics this primary immune response, but of course it, uh, you would not have disease you just start creating memory cells, antibodies, right? And um, that, uh, well, you create a memory cells and those memory cells can create antibodies. And that means if you are infected, you will need less time to fight this infection and it's not gonna be that severe. Um, so in this diagram, you can see uh, the plasma antibody concentration. All right, so, um, so that's, how how many antibodies you have in blood plasma uh, when we have primary um, infection and secondary uh, infection. So here, when we have a first exposure to the vaccine, uh, we have very low of the antibodies, but then it's it grows, right? And then it declines. So you don't have uh, antibodies over here, but what you have, you have your memory cells still circulating in your blood. So you have your memory cells. So now when we have the uh, second uh, exposure to the vaccine, um, then we create uh, way more uh, plasma antibodies. That means we create way more uh, memory cells and you, uh, you have these antibodies and memory cells longer. Uh, and that will um, help you, of course, when you have the infection to fight this infection. So then what is a vaccine? Vaccine is biological uh, preparation that creates acquired immunity. It made from weakened or killed forms of the microbe, it toxins or pathogen antigens. And of course we have a new uh, vaccine like uh, uh, COVID-19 vaccine now that has RNA of the um, the, the virus that's you know um, something new in vaccination. So vaccine uh, stimulates the bodies to com 
deplete the primary immune response and create memory cells. So when you get this vac vaccine, you start creating memory cells. And upon exposure um, to the actual pathogen, body creates secondary immune response and destroys the pathogen before major harm to the body uh, uh, happens. Right, so when we get this vaccine, when we have this uh, weaken or kill form or toxins of the uh, bacteria or virus, this allow your body to create memory cells ahead of a time, and you keep them. So now, when uh, you really have the disease, right? When you have now uh, active living pathogens, you don't need to go through the primary response that will takes about week for you to start even fighting and that enough time to damage your organs. So this will take now one or two days to start fighting the infection and uh, prevent this bacteria from or virus uh, from excessive um, uh, division, right? So you uh, proliferation. So you don't, uh, so this virus and bacteria don't have even chance to multiply uh, that much that it start affecting and destroying your tissue and your organs. Okay. Uh, so there is no a connection between vaccination and OT, autism, as um, you know, some misconception are, or weakening of the immune system. Problem with lack of informed decision about vaccination had, uh, has led to outbreaks of chickenpox and measles recently. Um, yeah, so some people, of course, don't want the uh, vaccination. They believe that it can cause some uh, problems to the body, autism. So it, it, now your immune system will not work because you use this vaccination. This is not really true. Uh, <clears throat> however, do some people might have allergy um <clears throat> so now what is allergy it's a hypersensitivity so, to substances that are not harmful such as pollen food animal hair we call them allergens um so when these uh, substances enter uh, our body or they um try, uh, they are you know on our skin then your cells um secret histamine and this high level of histamine in your blood this what called allergy reaction it's a stimulation of mucus of nose and eyes in the presence of histamine uh, happens as well um, so these substances that should not be harmful uh, in some people your immune system treats it as a, a pathogen something that not supposed to be in your body and start fighting it by releasing histamine because histamine is released to start inflammatory reaction and inflammatory reaction should really help you uh, to fight infection but in this situation you don't have an infection um, so we can test uh, people on the um, uh, suspected allergen so when we take a um, a small amount of this allergen and we gonna um um, um uh, uh, um, inject it uh, very superficially um, and see how the skin reacts. So if, if we have a redness and inflammation, that means there is uh, allergic reaction to this particular passage, uh, um, um, allergen, but on the others, uh, we don't have a reaction over here. Right, so that's allergy. And another, um, the last slide over here talking about anaphylactic shock. Um, this is life-threatening immediate uh, allergic response because allergen has entered the bloodstream. Um, so when allergen enters the bloodstream, it causes drop in the blood pressure due to increased permeability of the capillaries by histamine. So we already know that when we have this allergy, when it enters your body, your cells uh, release histamine. So if this allergy in your blood, right, then a large amount of histamine is released, your capillaries be became permeable, and the blood or plasma, plasma leaks out of your capillaries into your tissue, and this will cause a uh, drop in blood pressure. Um, now, what do we use? We use epinephrine because epinephrine is a chemical that counteracts the reaction of histamine. Um, you probably heard about EpiPen, 
right? So you have this uh, quick injection of epinephrine and what epinephrine does, it's uh, constrict your blood vessels. Um, so um, anaphylactic shock can be because of the penicillin. Some people can be uh, allergic to penicillin or bee stings. So that's the example uh, of the uh, uh, substances that can cause anaphylactic shock. And on this picture, you see this EpiPen. So people who know they are allergic, they should have it handy and this injection um, can save their life, right? So as I said, this was our last slide. Um, so we covered lymphatic system today. Thank you for um, watching and I hope it was helpful.